Craig's Gun Channel. In a prior video, I used the Wayback Machine to go back to the 70s to shoot a favorite toy of mine, the Rayline Rapid Fire Jet Disc Gun. Well, I'm needing to do some more shooting, and with ammo being in short supply, I thought I'd use the Wayback Machine again to go back and do some more practice. Now, anyone who travels through time knows that you shouldn't go back too many times to the same time and place, so I won't be looking at the Jet Disc Gun again. Instead, we'll take a look at something different. Ray Plastic Company was a prolific toy manufacturer that produced a huge array of products in the Rayline brand in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Their top sellers being toy guns of all types, with many that shot kid-safe ammo. Well, kid-safe for back then, anyway. Before, I went back to shoot the Rayline Jet Disc Tracer Gun, but they made another favorite of mine that was offered at the same time, the Zebra II Automatic Pistol. The Zebra II was an inexpensive plastic gun that sold for just a few dollars, and it could be purchased anywhere cheap plastic toys could be found, including five and dimes, drugstores, and even supermarket checkout aisles. They were packaged on blister pack cards and came with a starter supply of ammo, which consisted of a small rubber-like vinyl pellets. These pellets, called Soft Safe or SS ammo, were about a quarter inch and were a whitish or yellow color. You generally were given a small supply with the gun, and luckily you could use them over and over. That is, until you lost them all. Luckily, you could purchase additional supplies separately. The guns themselves had a futuristic ray gun type styling, and when Rayline made them in the US, they were originally a blue or greenish gold toned plastic. Later during their production, manufacturing was outsourced to China, and their colors changed to vibrant yellows and oranges. On top of the gun was a small sliding cover to access an internal magazine, and this is where you would load the pellets. You would load around 50 of them in the magazine, providing a lot of childhood firepower. Once loaded, gravity fed the pellets into the firing mechanism one at a time. When you pulled the trigger, it would cock and release a spring that would fire the pellet. You could fire as fast as you could pull the trigger, but sometimes you'd have to shake it a bit to, you know, in between shots to ensure that the pellet dropped into position to fire. Volume of fire was important, as accuracy was less than exceptional. Once fired, the pellets would shoot out of the gun with a range of around 20 feet. I remember having a couple of them when I was a kid, and I left them on the patio. Let's see, when was that? It was April 23rd, 1983. Let's go take a look, see if they're still there. Wow, that worked pretty good. Let's take a look to see if they're still here. <laughs> hey, they are. Let's go ahead and take a look. We have here two of them. Uh, this was one of the uh, original ones. It's the uh, older one from the 70s. And in the early 80s, they started making them uh, actually uh, overseas in China. And uh, they're, they're clearly marked made in USA on the one and uh, made in China on the other. So we'll go ahead and take some shots with these and see what they're like. We'll go ahead and start with the Made in USA, the original one. This is one from the 1970s. And we're not out. Uh, just about. This might be the last shot. <laughs> as you can see, uh, the power may have went downhill a little bit. The springs aren't quite as springy as they used to be, but, you know, for 30 plus years, you can't ask for too much. So we'll go ahead and reset the target, and then we'll go ahead and try the slightly newer one from the uh, early 80s, uh, the one that was made in China after they switched the production over there, and see how well that one does. And now we have the one from the, uh, the 80s, the main made in China. Uh, by this time, the colors had went from the gold and the blues more to uh, bright colors, like a bright yellow and bright orange. So we'll go ahead and see if this one does any better. I can tell right away the spring is a little bit better.
Man, looks like one shot left. <laughs> so what kind of speed can you really get out of these things? Let's go ahead and set the chronograph up and we'll, we'll take a look at that. We have the uh, chronograph set up, so we'll go ahead and take a couple shots. First, we'll start with the uh, made in China one. Uh, this is the one from the uh, 1980s. We'll see what it does. No reading. 46. Forty-six. Forty-four. Forty. Forty. Thirty-seven. error 40 that was the last one on this one we'll go ahead and try the original one thirty four I don't think that one read <laughs> twenty three 34, another 34, 33, an error, now well, that one of course didn't read, 32, we got one more shot here. Another 32. Now, just for the sake of comparison, uh, what we have here is a current uh, modern airsoft. This is a CO2 powered airsoft. So we'll go ahead and take some shots with it just to get an idea of the difference between the toys from when we were young to the toys that are out there now. As we can see, a little bit of a difference there uh, by a factor of around, uh, well, almost, um, well, factor of 10 anyway. So. The Zebra II remained in production by Rayline into the mid 80s or so, and they were first manufactured stateside and then eventually outsourced to China. The original blue and gold colors changed to bright yellows and oranges in an effort to more easily identify them as toys as moods were changing and toy guns had started to fall out of favor. Over time, sales continued to decline and eventually production stopped in the mid to late 80s. And those cheap plastic guns that sold for a dollar or so are now considered collectible items. And with mint condition still in the package examples, they're able to bring substantial amounts of money. While I don't have any of the ones I had as a child, several years ago I did come across one at a flea market. It was one of the original goldish models, but no ammo was with it. Just recently, I acquired another one, a later production, the, one of the yellow ones, right here, and I uh, was able to get some ammo with it as well. I was able to get those off of eBay. I had a lot of fun shooting them as a kid, and I think they're still fun today. They shoot a lot like I remember, but, well, I recall them maybe having a little bit better range and maybe a little bit better than what they are now, but that's likely just the result of time and faded memory. And I'm sure that the 30 to 40 year old springs inside them might not have quite as much oomph as they used to. One of the things I always wondered about when I was a kid was why was it called the Zebra II? I found out later that it was called that because it was the follow-up gun to Rayline's original SS pellet firing gun, the Zebra. I don't remember seeing one of those in the aisles as a kid, but it could just be that I was more drawn to the futuristic look of the Zebra II. That look itself was inspired by a real-life pistol produced in the mid-1950s, the Whitney Wolverine pistol. In fact, this is almost an identical scaled-down version of the Whitney Wolverine. The real version was made out of aluminum instead of plastic, and it fired 22 long rifle. 
I know that this is not the typical type of review that I do, however, I wanted to change gears a bit to enjoy some nostalgia and to take me back to a time when times were much simpler. I enjoyed making this video, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. So until next week, stay safe. The, uh, the bronze collar, and it's the one that's uh, marked as made in the USA. Now this one does have a little bit of a trigger problem, so 